Ah, okay, so I just got back from a weekend with my parents. Happy birthday, mum. My hair's a mess, my makeup's a mess, and it's getting dark outside. And I forgot to do a wrap-up video, so that's what this is. Hi, welcome to what I read in August. August? Yes, because it's autumn now. I like autumn. Let's go. I read a lot of stuff in August. Ten books, no manga, no comics. Did I read any comics? I don't know. Anyway, ten books, one of which I don't have with me because I lent it to my partner. She hasn't read it yet. Yukio Mishima. I read three Yukio Mishima books. I did this as a sort of project to myself. I went into the Stanza bookshop in The Hague, shout out to them, and I got these books. It was a challenge in the sense that I don't like Yukio Mishima as a person. He was a fascist. But I made a video talking about whether or not he was a fascist and how his fascistic politics are complicated and not as straightforward as you think because nationalism is a complicated thing depending on the nation and the circumstance and he was also queer and a very complicated, interesting, strange, dramatic figure. Anyway, you can watch my video because this is just a ramble where I'll probably say things wrong. Go watch that video that was a lot more coherent a little bit more coherent. I read these books. This one, Star, is about what fame is like. It's a tiny little, more like a short story than even a novella, about what it's like to be famous and how strange it is, how surreal fame is, and it looks at how famous people are often people. And that means they're terrible sometimes and interesting a lot of the time. This one, Beautiful Star, is a weird book that Yukio Mishima called his own personal favourite. He considered it his magnum opus and I thought it was fine. I thought that it had some mixed political messages. I thought he was trying to be too politically intense with it and it didn't work. One of those novels that is a political message, like the kinds of things that Ayn Rand did, and I thought it was a bit muddled. It made me feel like he didn't really understand his own political beliefs, which I think makes him even more curious and interesting as a person, honestly. But Beautiful Star is a weird sci-fi novel about a family that believe they're all from different planets in our solar system, and they are on Earth to try to save us from ourselves. It kind of looks at the end state of capitalism, the end state of globalization, the end state of a lot of terrible human endeavors. And it's decent, but not great. This one, however, is basically a gothic romance. It is a bleak, horrible, Bronte-esque novel full of really terrible people who are being terrible to one another, have difficult lives, and are difficult in exchange. I really, really adored this. I think that this is Yukio Mishima at his peak, where he's being a very overtly queer, dramatic, feminine, kind of romantic, gothic, angsty teenager. It's fun. I love gothic fiction, I love the Brontes, I love the angst of their books, and this really has that. It's just full of unlikable, dramatic people being overly dramatic, sensual, sexual, lustful, angry. It's delicious, it's a tasty, tasty gothic romance novel, and I really think whether you like Mishima or not, and I typically don't, you should still check out Thirst for Love. It is tasty. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, especially if you like gothic romance. Mm, tasty book. What else did I read? Otessa Moshveig. Big fan of her now, thanks to Lapvona and this, My Year of Rest and Relaxation. This is her most celebrated and famous novel, and I get why. I would say I probably still prefer Lapvona, but that's because Historical fiction and fantasy are two of my favourite genres, and Lapvona sits somewhere between the two. It's dark and bleak and strange, surreal, disgusting in places, and so it really speaks to me and the things that I kind of grew up reading and still love to read now. My Year of Rest and Relaxation is a more grounded piece of literary fiction that explores oof, a lot of stuff. It's about a woman in the year 2000 who has decided, in spite of all of her money that her parents left her, all of her wealth and privilege, living in a beautiful apartment in the... What's it called? Northeast corner of Central Park, Manhattan. Upper East Side. The Upper East Side. She's living there, beautiful area, beautiful flat, and yet she just kind of wants to collapse, and so she gets a very, very dangerous, 
irresponsible and possibly psychopathic therapist to just fill her up with a cocktail of drugs that'll put her into a kind of coma for a year where she will then wake up and feel rejuvenated. And I think it's a fascinating exploration of the life that we live right now and the ways in which we tackle just how awful life is for so many of us. It feels like a kind of rebellion against the status quo in the most pathetic way possible. Instead of rioting, instead of throwing rocks, attacking the system in a more physical way, we sleep. <laughs> because we're tired and we're fed up and we don't know what to do with ourselves. That's kind of what this book feels like. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I know that it has problems. And when I did a video on it, I had some really great commenters talking about fat phobia, ableism, all sorts of really problematic aspects to not just this book, but her writing in general. And I do think Otessa Moschweg is a problematic writer, but I go back and forth on her. And what's interesting is every time I sit on the fence when it comes to her, I get people on either side telling me that I need to wise up in some way. Wise up, she's terrible, she's ableist, blah. And then if I acknowledge that ableism, people on the other side say, wise up, she's punk and aggressive and she does what she wants and she takes no prisoners or whatever. And I'm like, ah, she's a problem, but she writes good books, please don't hurt me. Ah. <laughs> Otessa Moschweg is great as an author. I think that she sometimes acts like an internet troll and I wonder if she does all of that intentionally just to piss people off, which in itself is pretty immature and pathetic. So I go back and forth on her, but I'm going to continue to read her because her writing is incredibly thought-provoking. I love what she does with her stories, her ideas, her characters, and the fact that she is a woman writing unlikable heroines, horrible people. It's important in today's society, in today's literary scene. She is a powerful writer and I really recommend this, but I recommend Latvona slightly more. I have to confess I didn't finish this and I only just realized that now. I read this on a plane. I was flying back from the Netherlands to the UK and I didn't finish it, partly because the plane ride was short and I really thought I could read it all on the plane journey and I didn't. And also because it was just kind of making me sad on the day. And then the next day I picked up a review copy and had to read that instead. But what I did read of this was really, really good. In the end, it was all about love. Is that what it's called? Yeah, by Musa Okwonga. It's the only book of his that I've read, but he is a writer and it is a autobiography about him moving to Berlin, originally from the UK. He is a black writer who encounters racism and homophobia. He compares Berlin to London, he talks about how Berlin is different from the rest of Germany, which I've heard a lot from people, especially as someone who actually would love to live in Berlin as well. I found it very enlightening, and it made me want to go back to Berlin as soon as possible. It made me feel so much empathy and sorrow on his behalf, and I found it very, very moving, but also very bleak, and I really should finish it. Paradise Rot by Jenny Haval, who is a Norwegian singer-songwriter and author. This is now one of my favorite books. I would honestly put it somewhere in my top 10, 15 books. It is fantastic. It is a modern, gothic, bleak, nasty thing. It's gross and it's literally full of piss. <laughs> you know that phrase, piss and vinegar, which I absolutely love? Yeah, this, this is quite literal in that regard. It is a book that's full of piss and vinegar literally the piss bit. How many times can I say piss in a video? It's a book about a woman who has moved from Norway to somewhere, I think the UK, not entirely sure, it doesn't specify. She's gone there for university, she's very sexually inexperienced, and she moves into a converted factory that's become a giant open plan apartment with no real rooms segregating things out, and she's living with this one woman, and the two of them have a lot of sexual chemistry but they also have a weird neighbor who kind of intrudes on their space as well. And pretty much the entire novel takes place in that apartment that only has these plywood boards separating out the rooms. Kitchen, living space, bedrooms, bathroom, everything. And so there is no real secrecy. And yet it has a lot of mind games and lies and twisting going on. Watch my full review because I could ramble about this one for a while. I thought that this was an electric novel. It is disgusting. It is very visceral when it comes to its body stuff, not just the piss stuff, said piss again, but also just the way that it deals with physicality and not just in terms of the body, but space itself. It is a book that you can feel, a book that you can get quite lost in, literally, 
as if you don't know where to turn next. It is a book about our physical relationships to one another, the ways that we interact, the ways that we fall in love, the ways that we lust after each other, and the way that sometimes the things that we say and do and feel can feel wrong for no good reason. There's a lot to love here. And I think everything I've just said is stuff I didn't say in that video, because this is a lot, and it's really tiny too. I loved it. I bloody love this book. Ghost Town by Kevin Chen, translated by Daryl Sturck, who is an amazing Mandarin to English translator. Another Berlin book. This author lives in Germany. This is a family drama. It is pretty dour. It is tough at times, and it hits pretty hard depending on what your family life is like. It's a book that talks about how we haunt one another. The ghost town in this book kind of has three obvious layers. One, it is set in a town that has a lack of population. Dearth? Darth? of population, I feel like if I say that I'll sound clever, but I'm not confident enough to actually say it. Lack of population. The population in this town has declined, but also there is a ghost festival that this family have all kind of reconglomerated to celebrate. So that's your second ghost. And then your third one, more importantly, is the family itself and the ways in which we haunt each other, whether we ourselves are dead or alive, we kind of haunt each other. Families haunt one another. Trauma is always there. When you think about family, you might feel trauma, and then when you see those people, that trauma rises to the surface, even more so than it might do on a daily basis. And our protagonist is a man who moved to Germany to try to live a happier life as a young gay man who fell in love and then somehow ended up killing his lover and went to jail for it for a few years and now he's come back. And you get his perspective, you get his family's perspective, they're all really traumatized and difficult people, and they all come together at this one time, this one moment, while we get lots of different narratives, lots of flashbacks. It's a very dynamic novel, and I adored it. Please check out my review for more information, but yeah, Ghost Town. Not enough people are talking about this brilliant Taiwanese novel. Check it out. I'll be doing a video on this very, very soon. That video is already recorded. I recorded it before this one because I forgot to make this one. A Prayer for the Crown Shy by Becky Chambers, the second monk and robot book. I loved the first one and I like this one almost as much. Not quite as much because it lacked the impact that the first one had. It is just a continuation of that story. It is about a young monk on a planet somewhere. Actually, I actually think it's a moon. Anyway, their job is to go around and deliver tea to people and have a chat with them in this little cart and wagon thing. And then they meet a robot. And the robot comes from a generation of robots that woke up. I, I, I'm not gonna recite it all now. Check out my video when it comes up. But also I have talked about Becky Chambers and the first book in other videos. You can check those out as well. I'll link it all in the description. I love Becky Chambers. And these books, the Monk and Robot series, is just a series of little novellas that explore Becky Chambers' own musings on life itself, more specifically our purpose. How we find a purpose, do we need a purpose, what exactly does purpose mean? And she just ponders all of that and turns those ponderings into these narratives where a monk and a robot chat with each other about purpose about how we move forward with our lives and why we do it and why we feel the need to, this compulsion to have purpose and meaning in our lives. It's beautiful and brilliant and very comforting. Both of the books, highly recommended, and there will probably be a third one. And then finally, I read 100 Queer Poems, which I will also do a video on, but I haven't made it yet. 100 Queer Poems is 100 Queer Poems. That's probably what I'll call the video. Mary Jean Chan and Andrew McMillan got together and edited together this collection of 100 Queer Poems. It is divided up into sections that are sort of themed. Things like queerness within the family, queerness in childhood, queer cities, queer landscapes, queerness in different avenues of life, and it's all beautiful. Some of the poets you will absolutely recognize in here, like Wilfred Owen, Carol Ann Duffy, but then there are also more modern poets that I am a huge fan of, like Peter Scalpello and Ocean Vuong, both of whom I've mentioned in previous videos. There's so much 
beauty in here. And not all of these authors are queer. It's interesting how they picked these poems. Some of them feel like queer poems. There is a queerness to them, in spite of the poets not necessarily being queer themselves. And I find that fascinating. I think I'm gonna have to ramble a bit about that in the video itself. But if you want an anthology of queer poems from modern day and back as far as probably 200 years ago, check out 100 Queer Poems. If you're a poem fan, poetry, poetry fan, you're gonna love this. It's good. Oh yeah, and the other book that I read was well, it's not here, is it? Light from Uncommon Stars, that was what it was called. Light from Uncommon Stars by Raika Aoki. Beautiful sci-fi fantasy book. I really, really enjoyed it. Please check out my video on it. It's like three videos back before this one. And it didn't get enough attention, in my opinion. But obviously that's up to you. I loved Light from Uncommon Stars. It was a perfect exploration of science fiction and fantasy. It's queer, it's quite tongue-in-cheek in places. And it has beautiful, wonderful trans representation, which was very important to me. And it's about three protagonists, a young transgender violin prodigy, a woman who has made deals with the devil multiple times, and an alien who runs a donut shop in California. If that sounds good to you, watch my video and read Light from Uncommon Stars. That's it. Now I have to go do my Patreon book club in like 20 minutes. This video is going to be up tomorrow. Brilliant. Subscribe for books.